themselves among the trees that were in the garden. The only way you will know that I'm the one talking out there is if you've ever heard me speak and you know my voice. So that tells us that Adam and Eve were very, very familiar with the voice of God. There had always been communication between him and this first couple. That's prayer, right? In the garden, Adam and Eve didn't have any need. They didn't lack anything. They were never sick. They didn't have a mother-in-law. So why did they need to pray? They didn't need to pray because they needed to connect with the creator. In other words, when God first created man, the reason he instituted prayer was for communion with him, for fellowship with him. It was only after the fall that he had to expand prayer to include supplication. But sometimes we turn our prayer times to honey-do list. We treat our friends the same way. See, the way we treat God is the way we treat our friends. There are some friends that we call when we're in trouble. And when we're not in trouble, we're too busy. How would you feel if every single time your friend called you was to tell you about their problems? You know what that generates? Problem-based relationship. So sometimes when we say, I have a personal relationship with the Lord, how does it look like? Is it problem-based? That's all you ever have to talk about with him. How do you grow in that when it's always about the problems? Fellowship is supposed to help us interact with him, with his spirit, to the point where his will becomes our will. We're always running off, seeking God's will, praying for God's will. All of this is his will. I say this, when you choose to pursue after him because you want to know him, not because you have any problem you want him to solve, you begin to know him. Everything else falls in place so he can actually instruct you on how to pray for your problems. Sometimes we're trying to pray away something that God allowed in our lives to use it to mold us. We're trying to pray it away, and we think it's the devil. We blame the devil for everything. Tell you a little story about me. There was a time when I was younger in the Lord. I would pray, seek the Lord, tell him to mold me because I wanted to be like him. And um, one day he gave me a picture of what I was doing. He said, mold me, mold me. He said, when I put you on the potter's wheel, I add some water and I punch down the clay. When I start spinning, you jump off the wheel. And then when you come to, you come back to me. Lord, this time I really, I really want to do this. I want you to mold me. Guess what happens? When I put you back on that potter's wheel, I have to add more water and punch down the uh, dough or clay or whatever. The dirt again. So I can start all over again. Until I became wise enough to not jump off. <laughs> And let him mold me. Relationship. Relationship. What does it look like? Hallelujah. It's letting him bring you to that place where you know his heart. Not so you can tell people what you know. Because guess what? When you know his heart, it manifests itself in your behavior. Like it was mentioned this morning. Have you ever heard an apple tree advertise itself? No, it doesn't. The fruit 
let's chill is an apple tree. Right? <laughs> so, whatever I am or I'm not in the Lord will show. That's what the Lord say, by their fruit, you shall know them. You know, they were also supposed to judge the fruit. But you can judge the fruit accurately if you do not know what the fruit is supposed to look like through the word. So, it's all about relationship. Because you see, without that, when life hits you, you will fall. It doesn't matter what you do, how much you pray, how much you fast. If you don't have that intimacy with him, if you're not fasting and praying for the right reasons, when life hits you, you will fall because you start wondering, why is it happening to me? I prove it to you because guess what? Humans don't change without the Lord. It doesn't matter how civilized. I know we like to knock ancient Israel. They were stiff-necked. So are we. They didn't have the Holy Ghost. We do. Listen to this. Isaiah 58. Shout aloud. Don't hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Proclaim to my people what rebels they are. <laughs> to the house of Jacob, their sins. Oh, yes. They seek me day after day. They claim to delight in knowing my ways. As if they were an upright people that had not abandoned the rulings of their God. They ask me for just rulings and claim to take pleasure in closeness to God. See all of those things that we do? Because each one of us will say, yes, I'm really seeking though I want to be close to the Lord. But they were doing the same thing. So wh why wasn't God pleased that they were seeking him? See, what I claim might not be the same thing as what God sees inside of me. Yeah, I'm seeking him to know him. I might say that to you. But God sees something, some other motive in me. Why I'm seeking him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And he goes on to say, why should we fast if we don't see? Or why should we mortify ourselves if we don't notice? Now, these were the people that were praying and fasting, asking this question of God. Why should I fast and pray and give and do this when you don't notice? So, or you do need to be noticed. Yeah. So the Lord says, here is my answer. When you fast, you go about doing whatever you like while keeping your laborers hard at work. Your feasts lead to quarreling and fighting and lashing out. <laughs> On the day that you fast, you do this to make your voice no heard on high. The Lord is letting us know if your motives are wrong, it doesn't matter how much you do it. And it's those wrong motives that lead us to say, I have been serving the Lord for 70 years. And he has not really done this for me or done that for me. And a lot of times we're lying. We have short memory when it comes to God's goodness. Because you see, He can do what he wants to do for you every single day, every single hour for 10 years. The first time things don't go your way, you're like, what is God doing to me? Why did he let this happen to me? And yet, he never promised that the cross will not get heavy, right? What is the cross? 
It's not a symbol of picnic, is it? It's a symbol of suffering. I know we don't like to talk about that word in America. Suffering. The American church. Suffering. And yet he said, if you don't suffer with me, you will not share my glory. Hallelujah. <laughs> Have you ever prayed for patience? Mm. You know what the Bible says? How you gain patience? Tribulation. He said, tribulation worketh patience. <laughs> um, probably about 20 years ago now. 20? Yeah, there about. My husband is not living for the Lord. Had never done so. And at that time I had prayed, Lord, make me like you. And I had tried to practice what I preach. But to cut the story short, one day I went into the bedroom and I saw my suit on the floor that he had dropped and just passed over it. That really upset me because I don't do that to him. So one day when I saw his clothes like that, I just walked by. And the Holy Ghost told me, go back, go pick it up. I said, but they don't belong to me. They belong to him. He saw them there. I engaged the Holy Ghost in arguing with him. And then the Father told me, he never asked me to make him like me. You did. So I had to go back. Guess what? In the process of letting God teach you these lessons, humility sets in. Humility is not something you pray for necessarily. It comes through obedience. If you choose not to obey, the law might allow you to be humiliated. There are two different things, humility and humiliation. So, willingly giving, you will learn humility. The Bible says he's humble. The Lord is humble. Yeah. That's part of this relationship thing with him. Hallelujah. I can tell you story after story about my experiences in my home. You mothers, I go to the, when the kids were little, of course, and I will complain to the Lord that I say one thing, they look at me, say yes, ma'am, and they do the opposite. So I went to the Lord to complain. When I was done yakking, the Lord said, you know exactly how I feel. That was ouch. Yeah, you know exactly how I feel because that's what you do with me. <laughs> yeah. Relationship. That's the interaction that the Lord expects that we have with his spirit. It's not just the praying, because you know what? When you're on your knees, you feel like you can take on the world. Until you get up from your knees, like that was mentioned this morning, and somebody slaps you. What do you do? Turn the other cheek or punch back? And sometimes it's not a physical slap necessarily, you know? Yeah, something just happens that gets under your skin. But what do you do? As you learn to interact with his spirit, he thickens your skin. After a few years, what used to get under your skin can no longer penetrate. I often tell people this. If your prayer life is not changing you, you know, take a step back and reassess your relationship with the Lord. I can't expect to pray for you to change when I have not allowed God to use my prayer life 
to change me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to look at another scripture here. Let me go to the new. These verses were talked about by your pastor on Thursday. Romans chapter 12, I'll just read verse 1 and 2. I exhort you, therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercies. <laughs> to offer yourselves as a sacrifice, living and set apart for God. This will please him. It is the logical temple worship for you. Wherever there is genuine worship out of relationship, there's always death that happened before. You guys remember the account of Abraham and his son? When he was taking him to Mount Moriah to sacrifice, what did he say? Myself and the lad will go up to worship and will come back. So wherever there is genuine worship, there is death. In our case, death to what? To my flesh. The Bible says once you receive the Holy Ghost and you're baptized in his name, you become a part of a royal priesthood. Do you know what happened in the Old Testament when the priest will go into the Holy of Holies when they were not clean? I'm not talking about dirt. You know what I mean? That's part of the reason when they had uh, a rope, a string or whatever tied to the ankle. So if they went to the Holy of Holies and standing before God with unclean hands and unclean heart, they died. And they would have to drag them out with that cord or rope. In our case, the Lord is looking for living sacrifices. So and when I present myself on the altar every single day in the morning, yes, people say you can pray every time, any time of the day. That is true. After all, we're told to pray without ceasing, right? So you have to pray all the time when you're awake anyway. You might have been praying your dreams. You don't know. Yeah. But morning prayer helps because it helps you set the tone for the day. That's when you present your body as a living sacrifice. So he will help you through the day to think on him. Because you see, you can engage in any spiritual warfare out there when you have not conquered the warfare in here. The mind. The mind. The mind. That's where the battle is. The mind. And we have been told that this is the sword of the spirit, the word. Soldiers don't dress up in their military fatigues and their weaponry and go on a picnic. It's to be very uncomfortable. You know how they dress up, you know? Think about that. So why do we try to do that as Christians? We are given the full armor of God to put on, right? If you're putting on daily, when you wake up, present yourself as a living sac sacrifice and you put on that armor, it means you're ready for battle all day. And that battle is not with demons out there, it's with flesh. When your flesh is defeated every day, you are engaging in the most profound warfare. 
Because that's the only way the demons out there are afraid of you. If you don't do this, you can huff and puff in prayer, and the demons won't care. They won't care. Because they're probably thinking, Paul, I know, Jesus, I know, who do you think you are? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Think about this. I exhort you, therefore, brothers, in view, because of God's mercies, don't take his mercy and grace for granted. Because of his mercy, offer yourself as a sacrifice that's alive and well. Set apart, separated. Because you see, there is no there's no way to build a relationship with the Lord. Even with human beings, friends and family, without separating yourself from something. There's always something you have to give up to be able to build this relationship. Separate yourself. And in this case, I have to be separated from the world. And one of the ways I separate myself from the world is separating my mindset from that old mindset. That's the only way that I can do it. Renewing, renewing my mind every day. When I go to the altar every morning, it's a time to renew my mind. Guess what? Just so you don't think this is impossible, because of his mercies, when you're doing that every morning, at the end of the day, remember, go back to him. Thank him for the victories. Repent for where you kind of uh, <laughs> shot back when you shouldn't. Maybe a harsh word. You repent and ask him to help you do better the next day. He's pleased with that because you're not pretending. You're not pretending. He knows what frame that we are made of, the Bible says. Thankfully, he knows that we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. I'm digressing a little bit here. You know why in ancient days, my country included, but mostly like in Israel, the shepherds will carry this, the one rod that has a hook on the end and straight at the bottom. Every good shepherd learns how to use that very well because they love their sheep. If you're asking David, he will tell you. When the sheep is going astray, the shepherd will use the straight end to pop it. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You know, there was spanking. God's spanking is supposed to bring me comfort. <laughs> because, you see, he said I only spank those that I love. If your mommy and daddy never scold you, don't spank you, and you think your mom and daddy they love you, that's not the truth. According to the Lord, if they really love you from time to time, I'm not talking about abuse. I'm talking about correction. And when that sheep falls in a pit because of rebellion, the good shepherd does not bear it alive. He uses the end that has a hook to pull the sheep from the ditch. It's relationship. It's relationship. For there to be that kind of love in a relationship, it has to be built and founded on truth. You can separate truth and, re and uh, love. If you claim to have truth but no love, you're lying. If you claim to have love that's not built on truth, then it's sinking sand. So, relationship. There's supposed to be honesty, truth. That's how you show love. Hallelujah. 
one of the things that trips us as God's children is that love thing. Most of the times, we don't remind ourselves of what God means by love. We think he's talking about what we think love to be. But to help us a little bit put things in perspective, let's see, I'm going to read a few verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I know I'm not a technical pastor, but I hope I'm not boring you guys. <laughs> uh, I may speak in tongues of men, even angels, but if I lack love, I have become merely a blaring brass or a symbol clinging. I may have the gift of prophecy. I may fathom all mysteries, know all things. You know that was? I can know this Bible from Genesis to Revelation backwards and forwards. But if I have no love, This is something else we talk about, faith. The Bible did say that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because in order for us to even make the first step to the Lord, we must believe that he is. And there is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. And yet, we can put our faith in the wrong place. Because guess what? He said to every man has been given a measure of faith. In other words, even unbelievers have faith. So just having faith, it's not a problem. He's already given faith. It's what you do with that faith. Let me read this verse 2 again. I may have the gift of prophecy. I may fathom all mysteries, know all things, have all faith, enough to move mountains. If I prayed for you for a situation and the Lord moved that mountain, what would you think? Oh, wow. She's a woman full of faith. God really uses her. And yet, it says, uh, if I have all faith enough to move mountains, but I lack love, I am nothing. So, in other words, it's possible to have faith that works. But I'm nothing before God. Because that faith is not built on his love. Hallelujah. I may give away everything that I own. I may hand over my body to be burned. You ask, how can somebody give their body to be burned? How can you give away everything you own if you didn't love the people? Apparently, according to God, you can. We can. Right? Otherwise, he wouldn't say it. We apparently, we can do that. Give our bodies to be born. Give everything we own. Give it out. And yet, we don't have godly love. It's a scary thought when you break these things down and think about it. It causes you to take a step back and reassess your relationship with him, to make sure. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Yes. I may give away everything that I own. I may hand over my body to be burned, but if I lack love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. You can say, I'm a kind person. But if you have not met the criteria, from verse 2 and 3, then that love and kindness you show is still not rooted in God's truth. There's so many, quote, unquote, kind people out there. And yet the Bible says that kindness, please correct me if I'm wrong, fruit of the spirit, am I right? So that tells me if I'm not giving myself to the Holy Ghost, my kindness cannot be a fruit of the spirit. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Love is not jealous. 
When you're dealing with jealousy, you need to take a step back and examine yourself. If there's something not right with your relationship with the Lord. Because the Lord, if you have the right relationship with him, won't allow you to get by with jealousy. Love is not boastful. Guess what they did in uh, Isaiah 58 that I read earlier on about fasting? When you say, or when they say, we fasted, we prayed, but you didn't take notice, we're boasting. You didn't notice me. Yeah. Love is not proud, rude, or selfish. We live in a very self-centered world. We are selfish beings by nature. So is that relationship again? If I seek him correctly, he will help me get rid of self-centeredness. Not easily angered. Have you had expression? That person wears their feeling on their shoulder. Mm -hmm. Not easily angered. Yeah. Think about that. Remember, anger is not a sin. The Bible says, be angry, but sin not. The very thing that was talking about in Sunday school today. Somebody can do something that really angered you, but you don't have to react to it. I call it response. As a child of God, you should respond and not react. Yeah. Because reacting, you are reacting to their action. But when you respond, response has the connotation of thinking through. When you think through before you say something back, you're responding. But when you react, they say you say something back. Or they punch you and you punch back, you're reacting. But response is when you take a moment. The world will take, tell you is it to take five or take ten or whatever. I don't know. When you breathe in and ask yourself, what would Jesus do? Again, it was mentioned this morning. If I don't prepare myself in the morning, then when those things begin to happen, boom, 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 boom. I tell my kids, when you don't prepare yourself in the morning spiritually, you're like somebody that had a test to do today. You didn't study. You went and did your test. You got back home and decided to go study after you flung the test. Yeah. But this is a daily thing. This is a daily thing. That's why Paul said, I die daily. See, everybody wants to have Paul's ministry. But nobody wants to do what Paul did. Paul wasn't special. I'm not saying that to disparage. I'm just saying he was a human being like the rest of us. But he allowed the Lord to take him from Saul to Paul. He had to go through a lot of weeding out in his life. There's a lot of weeding out. That's why he could say, the things that once charmed me, I count them all but dumb. Yeah. We can get to the point where the things of this world have no attraction for us anymore. And when I say the things of this, I'm not necessarily talking about just material. How about fame? How about trying to fit in? 
repent your faith in, but we have to be separate. Touch not the unclean thing. Sometimes the unclean thing is our thoughts. And the thoughts do not have to be immoral for them to be unclean. Yeah. Hallelujah. Sometimes I just thoughts of distraction. Are you easily distracted in your mind? Let me go back to the word. When you wake up in the morning, you have a choice. The devil can tell you, let's go to this closet. It's going to be a hard day. And you can choose to follow him and wear the garment that says it's going to be a hard day. Here we go again. It's a Monday. Or you can decide this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. That's not saying that everything that happens that day you will like. The day is not a good day or a bad day because of what happened or didn't happen. The day is a good day because God created it, period. It's relationship. You know, when he said he came to give us life and that more abundantly, what does that mean? If my relationship with him is not giving me that joy unspeakable and full of glory, I'm not talking about faking smile. I'm talking about joy that comes from within. If that's not happening, why? Did he lie to, to us? No. It means something is, is missing in me, in my relationship with him. Why am I emphasizing this relationship thing? Because you see, the word that I relate to him is manifested in the word that I relate to you. And we are his bride. No man, no good man likes his wife to be disrespected. So when I treat you with contempt, when we treat each other with contempt, we disrespect him. Relationship. Hallelujah. I'll be closing soon. One or two more scriptures and I'll be done. I, I want to show us again why seeking relationship, the proper relationship with the Lord is more important than anything else. Believe me, seeking relationship with him in prayer, when you're praying, talking to him to know him and listening for him to talk back to you and tell you what is a rebuke, what is encouragement. Sometimes he just wants to tell you how he feels, believe it or not. That's what good friends do. Yeah, and the Bible says he is a friend that sticks closer than your brother or sister. But I don't, we know those scriptures, but I don't think we take them seriously. If we took them seriously, we won't be so quick to fall apart when things are not working right. Nobody loves me. Well, did God stop loving you? I want to be loved by everybody that meets me or that I meet. But I know that's going to happen. Not everybody loved him, and he was perfect. And not everybody loved him. So why would I think everybody will love me? Even though He actually told us that not everybody will love us. If we're walking like he walked. So let me um, quickly read this. <laughs> not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we perform many, many miracles in your name? Okay. Where's the disconnect? There has to be a disconnect, right? I prophesied, I performed miracles on me, cast out demons in his name. Then I will tell them, 
to their faces. I never knew you. Get away from me, you workers of iniquity. I'm just going to challenge us to see the most important thing we can do is to keep our focus on our relationship with him. That will help us relate to each other in a better way. And then we won't have to worry too much about the demons out there. Because guess what? He is our father. So father-child relationship. He is our heavenly bridegroom. So husband and wife relationship. He is our friend. He is our Lord. There's so many facets of this relationship that we have to take as a whole if we want to be whole and work on that. Because like he said, get away from me, you workers of iniquity. How could I have done all of those things without having the type of relationship he wanted? It means I just choose him. And because I had faith, he honored my faith. And those things happened through me. Not necessarily because he approved of how I handled my life. So, I want us to bear this type of scriptures in mind and not disregard them or just brush over them. You know, that's why he went, if you read the rest of the chapter, he went on to say, if you hear these things that I'm telling you and you do them, then you're like a wise man. You don't necessarily have to go seeking wisdom or necessarily pray for wisdom. I'm not saying it's wrong. But when you hear what he's saying to your spirit and you obey, it means you are applying. Wisdom is, in a nutshell, applied knowledge. You can know all kinds of truths, but if you're not applying it, then you're not a wise person. And then he said, when a storm comes, your house will fall. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Let me close with this. Hallelujah. And now, my brothers and sisters, peace to you. Put yourselves in order. Pay attention to my advice. Be of one mind and live in peace. This is a Jewish Bible. Let me be honest. It says live in shalom. Shalom does not just mean our peace as we know in English language. Shalom means wholeness. Be made whole. Because think about it. I might be healthy physically, but if I have not allowed the Lord to heal my emotions, I will know no peace. Yeah. So, shalom means you've been made whole in your mind, in your spirit, in your soul. When you're made whole in your mind, spirit, and soul, even your body is racked with pain. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Put yourselves in order. Pay attention to my advice. Be of one mind. Live in shalom. And the God of love and shalom will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people send greetings to you. The grace of our Lord, Yeshua the Messiah, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.